Welcome to the scurrychurchofchrist.org. The Bible says in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, my people are destroyed uh, for lack of knowledge. Please don't let this happen to you. Feel free to contact us at scurrychurchofchrist.org uh, where you can visit us and any Bible question that you may have, we will do our best to answer. We are so glad you decided to visit us. A little deeper uh, tonight, it takes some studying, but um, it, it's simplified when you get into the Bible and listen and learn and dig in there. We're going to, you know, we've been discussing Jesus, uh, his divine nature, and we also, we saw him in a book of Revelation that he uh, was very active in the world and in his kingdom, his church, and he is still active today. Uh, we know from, from the text that he's sitting on the right hand of God, uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, and several other passages. Uh, but that does not mean he is not active. He is very active. And we also uh, discuss, uh, we saw him in the book of Acts when Stephen was stoned, he was standing up looking. So Christ is very active. Uh, he's God. He's God. Um, and we talked about he, when he lowered himself in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 11, he did not give up his deity. He did not give up his divine nature. Uh, he gave up some things, but not his deity. And, and that's shown by uh, the virgin birth. Let me, let's look at this quickly. Uh, go to Luke chapter one. I want to make this clear. Luke chapter one in verse uh, 31. Luke chapter one in verse 31. Go there with me. Let me find it. Now, I want you to understand something. We, we, uh, I'll say, you know, the son, the father, as I go to the old covenant, but I'm just borrowing those terms. Uh, the Christ was not the son uh, in the old covenant. And I believe he, came to, he became the son in the new covenant. And so uh, you see that he, he took a lower position. But remember, he did not give up his deity. He was divine. He had a divine nature. When he took upon himself a flesh, uh, he gave some things up. We, 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 we learned, uh, we talked about those things. And so I want you to see something here in Luke chapter 1 and verse uh, 31. Notice when he becomes a son. And so as we look at the old covenant, he's actually not the son. Uh, Christ is deity. Uh, he always uh, has a, he always contained a divine nature. And so notice when he becomes a son in chapter one, verse 31, he says, and behold, you will conceive in your womb. He's talking to Mary and bear a son and you shall name him Jesus. That's a savior. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And so you see when he becomes the son, the son of God. Now I want you to see that. And so, you know, we say the father, the son, the Holy Spirit, that's fine. But actually when you get technical, he didn't really become the son until the new covenant, until the birth, until his birth. But remember what I'm telling you, he did not give up his deity. And so let's to get in to learn more about him. Uh, let's get into the Godhead as it relates to him. So remember in Revelation, now remember before we saw, we see Christ, uh, we know he was eternal. We see him in the old covenant. And when he took upon himself a flesh, we saw him as a man. He gave up some things in John 17. Uh, he talks to the father to give him back what he gave up. And when he died, resurrected, and ascended to the father he received, the father gave those things back to him. And so now he's reigning as king, but he's still divine. And one, and there is, you know, an indication that he gave something up was because he was always divine, but the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, resurrected him from uh, the dead. 
And so, but now he's reigning. I want you to understand something. He is reigning. Remember, we talked about he created the world. The world belongs to him. We looked at that. We discussed that pretty thoroughly. He saw his order in the creation. John 1 talks about that. So the world belongs to him. And that's why when you get into Revelation, he's, uh, he's uh, avenging the saints. And he's also punishing the Roman Empire. You see them working in there, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But there's a lot of emphasis on Christ because he is the king defend, defending his kingdom. Also, we get that idea in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, you see God and the Father there. So the kingdom of God is extremely important. He will defend us. Uh, he will work with us behind the scenes providentially. Very important to God. He purchased, Christ purchased the church uh, with his own blood. So he died for uh, the church. And so remember what I so remember John 1 uh, 30 or uh, uh, rather Luke chapter 1 verse 31 to 32 I want you to you know there's something that we you know I looked at he did not become the son until uh, you see his birth then he is the son of God so before that and that, you know, that all ties in with the with his birth and his and and, and taking upon himself a flesh he uh, has always been divine. He didn't give that up. Let's look at this uh, divine. Now, I, we say the Godhead. Let's go to Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, 29, I believe. Romans chapter 1 and verse 29. You know, we talk about the Godhead, but do we really understand the divine nature of Christ? Romans 1, I believe in 29. Now, I'm going to do something different tonight. I want someone to read. If you have the King James Version, I want someone to read that. I'm going to put my uh, computer on mute, and I want someone to read James, or rather Romans chapter 1. And uh, uh, let me go to verse 29. Give me a second to go there. Kyle, if you have it, uh, I don't know, uh, you can read that for me. Yeah, I can get it. What was it again? Give me Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. But I, I need you to have the King James Version. Okay, Colossians 2 and verse 9 and King James. Yeah. Yes. It says, For him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Okay, that's all. Now, go to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And I believe that's, uh, let's go to, I believe that's uh, verse 29. Uh, let me go to Acts 17. Yes, this is, this is actually the verse that W.A. used to quote all the time. Go ahead and read it for me. For him, we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Is that 17 in verse 29? Acts 17 in verse 29? That was 28. Sorry, I'm going to read the next one. For as much then we are his offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold, silver, or stone, graven by art and man's device. All right, now, thank you, Carl. In my in American Standard Version, is going to say divine nature. Like in Acts 17 and verse 29, being then the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone. Uh, an image formed by the art, uh, by the art and thought of man. And so you notice Kyle read in the King James Version, the uh, divine, uh, he read the Godhead. And then in the American Standard Version, it is um, a divine nature. And so uh, that's what it is. When you, when you look at the Godhead, it's his divine nature. And so Christ has still has, never gave up his divine 
nature. Even though he lowered himself, he took uh, upon himself a flesh, uh, he still had the divine nature. But in that divine nature, there were different roles. The father played his role. It was his plan. We talked about that. Holy Spirit uh, uh, played his role and the son played his role, but he never gave up his divine nature. And that's what Colossians chapter two, verse nine is saying. When I'm going to go back, I'm going to go there. Thank Kyle for reading that. Now notice what my Bible says. Colossians two, uh, nine. I don't know why I'm in Hebrews. Let me go to, let me find Colossians. So that's Colossians 2, 9. And it's going to say he has the fullness of the Godhead uh, bodily. But I want to go there and read that. Now, in American Standard Version, it says, for in him, all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. That's right. That's that divine nature. And so within that body that he had, uh, he uh, still had divine nature, human body, divine nature, human body, divine nature. And, and so that's the Godhead. It's that it's that divine nature. Um, man doesn't have it. An animal doesn't have it. Uh, angelic beings, uh, spiritual beings, they don't have it. Uh, God has a divine nature. So when you see the Godhead, I want you to think about divine nature, but it's a divine nature that possesses three distinct personalities. I'm going to say that again. It's a divine nature that possesses. Now, the nature, you know, the nature is, is divine and, and there are characteristics that make up that divine nature. We look at um, those character those characteristics. He's uh, infinite. Man is finite. Um, God is omnipotent. Uh, no one else is, um, no human being is omnipotent. Um, angelic beings, the spiritual beings are not omnipotent. We see that in the old covenant. You know, God gave them the ability to do what they do and he managed them. They did exactly what he said to do. And so as we, the Bible reveals to us who God is, he's a spirit. And as we look at the Bible, we find out, okay, who is this God? He's omniscient, all-knowing. He's omnipotent, all-powerful. He's in. He's infinite. He's 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 infinite. He, he's uh, everywhere. I mean, his. I mean, his his he's limitless. You can't even measure. There's no measurement to. He's just limitless. And so he has a distinct nature, and nothing else on this earth uh, has that divine nature. But Christ had it. He has it. He has, you know, remember what I said, I want to make this clear. He made, Christ makes it clear in the Bible that he was in the beginning. He was eternal and he took upon himself a flesh, still divine nature, sitting on the right hand of God, still divine. He still has a divine nature. So that's the Godhead. And remember what I said, there's three distinct personalities in that divine nature. I want you to understand that. And so there was actually a one God. See, God is uh, is one as in nature. There's not three gods. See, there's not three gods. There is one God. That's that divine nature. And within that nature, there are three distinct personalities, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when you get into their movements, movement, they um, they work in perfect harmony. They operate in impeccable harmony. See, they operate in perfection. Their harmony is impeccable. It's perfect harmony. <laughs> it's very interesting. You look at these other gods in the Bible, like uh, Zeus and Hercules, etc. You see them fighting. The false gods they fighting against each other. You know, but. Those are false gods. Uh, the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, our God, that's the nature is God. And he has three distinct personalities who they operate in perfect harmony. And, and, and that's, that's what God requires from us. You know, we get into division, we get into, uh, 
you know, how God requires the church to, to get along with one another and how we should sacrifice ourselves to one another and put others before ourselves. You know, that's that harmony that he expects from his church. And, you know, without that harmony, that's, you know, it's a sinful not. That's why God hates that. He hates uh, division. When you look at, uh, I think, a sixth thing the Lord hates, you see that in there, uh, of one who sows discourse, that type of division. That's not of his nature. I see where, where his church, where his kingdom, and he, he, require, he requires us to be like him. So remember, we are the light of the world. We show people who God is by our actions. And so we have to be careful because if we don't do that, then that's a sin against God. And the way of sin is death. And, and that's why it's important for us to learn more about him, more, more, learn more about his nature to see where we fit in. If, as we study him, we go to the new covenant, we realize that our behavior actually fits into his nature. It tells us how to love, then it says God is love. See? How, how do we love? Well, God is love. And then he explains to us how we need to do that. And we need to be taught how to love. The Bible teaches that. How am I taught? How, I'm taught how to love from the Bible. And so what the Holy Spirit gives us information about God, who is love and how to do that. And then we look at Jesus, who epitomized love. His actions. I mean, he, he, he was a perfect example of what God requires. He was in the image of the Father. And so, um, so there are three distinct personalities. I want you to see that three distinct personalities. One God. We're not saying there are three gods. No. The God is, is his nature, his uh, divine nature. And that divine nature possesses three distinct personalities. So that's when you see the Godhead. Now, remember, like I had Kyle read the King James Version. It said the Godhead, which is fine. But, when you, but the New, New American Standard Version Basically, that's the meaning of it, uh, is that divine nature. So think about that. So we say that divine nature. Jesus, the Son of God, he has that divine nature. Always had it. And in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 again, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. I want you to catch that. In him dwells a fullness See, in him dwells the fullness of deity. See, in him, all the, let me read that again. In him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. So we know he took upon himself a bodily form. So that's plain right there that deity dwell, dwelt in that bodily form. Never gave it up. You know, when I the, in, in the Pentecostal of belief, and we're gonna we're gonna uh, look at this, and then we're going to uh, kind of study from their belief and learn more of deity. A lot of people don't study this, and some people do, but in the Pentecostal uh, belief system, they believe that um, there's not three distinct personalities. There's only one personality, and that's Jesus only. Okay, that's why if, if like if you go to them and and you are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, which is doctrinal, that's doctrine. They would baptize you again, be baptized in Jesus only. And so, according to them, there's only one uh, personality. So how they do that? So it's like. Um, when Christ was in heaven originally, he's the father. When he came to the earth, he became the son. See, that's him. When he went to heaven and came back again, he became the Holy Spirit. So there was, according to them, there was only one person in the Godhead. You see, there's only one person in the Godhead. So this is this is important to us to study this. And as we you see that there are different beliefs in, in these uh, different uh, sects, religious sects. And that's what they believe. 
And what does the so let's let's what does the Bible teach? And I'm going to show you a passage that they go to. Let's go to Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44. The Bible is very interesting when you get into it. Uh, the context will explain itself. So Isaiah 44. So the Bible teaches there are three distinct personalities. There is uh, one divine nature. Okay, remember, three distinct personalities, that divine nature, that's the God, that's God. You say God, that divine nature. And understand, you know, the false idol worshiping, those false idols, that's kind of ludicrous, ridiculous, because anything made by man does not have a divine nature. Very interesting. If you get into the concept. Not even an angel has a divine nature. And we see that, how God managed him. And they did exactly what God said to do. Uh, man does not have a divine nature. And animals don't. But someone can make a false god and idol and say, worship this image. It's like, it's like they giving this image a divine nature. That's, that's, that, is, that is ludicrous. That's ridiculous. The more you get into the text, that's ridiculous. That's basically what Isaiah is saying. So one of the... One of the uh, verses they will use is Isaiah 44, and I believe it's verse 24. So let's, let's, let's learn from that. Let's learn from that. Isaiah 24, or rather Isaiah 44 and verse 24. We're going to keep it in context. I'm going to read it. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and the one who formed you from the womb. I, the Lord, am the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out the earth all alone. Okay? Read that again because I want us to get it. If you, if you just get in there, I'll give you time. Thus says the Lord your God, your Redeemer, and the one who formed you from the womb, womb, I, the Lord, am the maker of all things, stretching out uh, the heavens by uh, myself and spreading out the earth all alone. So they, so they will look at this and say, uh, see, God did this alone. Now, it's very interesting. If we look at this text and go back what we studied about, you know, how all three were in the creation, this kind of contradiction contradicts a lot of scriptures that we study in the Bible. So there, what is it saying? Let's look at the, let's look at the context. And now he's comparing himself. He's making a contrast between himself and the idols. Understand that when you read the text, he's making a contrast between himself and the idols. See, um, look at verse nine. I let the text deal with it. He says, watch, those who fashion a graven image are all of them futile and their precious things are of no profit. Even their own witnesses fail to see or know so that they will be put to shame. See, who has fashioned a God or cast an idol to no profit? Behold, all the companions will be put to shame for the craftsmen, craftsmen themselves are mere men. Let them all assemble themselves. Let them stand up. Let them tremble. Let them together be put to shame. Uh, the man shapes iron into a cutting tool and does his work over the coal, coals, fashioning it with hammers and working it with the strong arm. He also uh, gets hungry and, he, he and, and, and his strength fails. He drinks no water. And becomes weary. Another, listen, see, it's ridiculous. Another shapes wood. He extends a measuring line. He outlines it with red chalk. Uh, he works it with planes and outlines it with a compass and makes it like the form of a man, like the beauty of a of man, so that it may sit in his house. Surely he cuts cedars of himself and takes a cypress or an oak and raises it for himself among the trees of forest, he plants air fair, uh, fair, and and the rain makes it grow. Now watch this. Then it becomes something for a man to burn, so 
He takes one of them and warms himself. <laughs> he also makes a fire to bake bread. He also makes a god and worships it. He makes a graven, a graven image and falls down before it. See? And so he's dealing with idol worshiping here. Remember, when someone when we're dealing with you know people and and we speak the truth and love and we, you know, we're, when we teach someone is to help them see to help them grow. You know, this is we're talking about salvation here, and so allow them to see the context. You know, if you just pick up this verse, like verse twenty four, okay, it's somebody would say, well, it makes sense, but look at the context. He's he's uh, discussing himself in contrast in contrast to idols. See. So alone, uh, in the creative process, alone he created. Uh, alone he was, you know, he didn't. He did not need the help of any idols to do that. Those things not even real, you know. And you get into idol worshiping and how they, especially in Egypt, how they related those idols and images to the creation, etc. And so, God, in contrast to what the deal is here with these idols. No, he didn't. He did not need their help. He did not get the help to do anything. They're nothing. He, the God, did it himself. Doesn't mean he is alone. He just did not need their help. See, I read that again. Thus, verse twenty-four. Thus, uh, the Lord, your, your Redeemer, and the one who formed you from the womb. See, the one who formed you from the room, he, create, he created you, he created them, he created us. I, the Lord, am the maker of all things. See, he's, he's the creator. He did not need the help in the creative process. Stretching out the, the heavens by myself, in contrast to the idols. You didn't help me, I did not need your help. I, the God, did that. So we can put that in the, you know, the divine Godhead, that, that divine nature did that. You know, in contrast to idols, you don't have a divine nature. You're just something that a human being made and decided to fall down and worship you. And then if they need be, they'll take you and throw you in the fire and use you to get warm. See, I, the Lord, am the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself. Do not need your help. Do not need you. And, sp and spreading out the earth all alone. See, do not need, no, in, in contrast to idols. See, God alone, in contrast to, in contrast to idols, made it happen. Verse 24, that's, that's I love it. I love it. Now watch. Let's go to John chapter eight. Go to John chapter eight. But before that, before that, we're going to go there. Before that, I want you to look at uh, verse six. Watch this. Now remember what we we're learning from this doctrine. Um, the obviously the Pentecostal uh, for our friends in the Pentecostal say uh, that, um, of course, they. I obviously believe in the nature, divine nature of God, but it's like it, that's the, it. you know, it's false doctrine because within a divine nature of God, there are three distinct personalities. To say there's one personality, there's, there's just Christ, or Jesus only, that's not the God of the Bible. You see, and so remember that, they, remember they're saying there's only one personality that's. So that excludes the Father and the Son. And remember Isaiah 44 verse 24 is one of the passages that they, one of the verses that they use. So you have to keep it in context. Look at verse 6 of 44. Verse 6 of 44. Watch. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel. I want to see if you grasp this. Now we're going to see some distinct personalities here. Thus says the Lord, watch this catch. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel. That's one. See, stay, you can stay in chapter 24 and deal with that. Ch I mean, chapter 44 and deal with this. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, that's one. And his Redeemer, that's two. The Lord of hosts. I am the first 
and I am the last. There is no God besides me. Watch, catch it, I'll read it again. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, that's Jehovah God, and his Redeemer, that's two. The Lord of hosts, he's also Jehovah. Now, the Lord of hosts, he said, I am the first and I am the last. There is no God besides me. So you see that, you see right here, you see, now I'm putting the Holy Spirit in here because the Holy Spirit is the reason why we have the doctrine. What you see here is that there are two distinct personalities who call themselves God. They have that divine nature. So you see it right here. But now watch, watch this. Um, Revelation chapter one and verse 17. Revelation one, verse 17. It ties in to what we've been studying before. Uh, Revelation chapter one and verse 17. Now, who is this? It says, I am the, he says, um, I am the first and I am the last and there is no God besides me. Revelation 1 and verse 17. Now, I want, I'd like someone to read that for me. Revelation 1 17. Revelation 1 17. Someone read that. Anybody home? Kyle, will you read that for me? Revelation 1 17. Yes, I'm going to read it out of the King James. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Okay, so this is Christ. This is Christ. This is him. Okay? So you notice it. And so if you go back to... Um, Isaiah 44, in verse, the end of verse 6, I am the first, and I, I am the first, and I am the last. There is no God besides me. So that's Christ. See, in Revelation 1, 17, Christ applies it to himself. So right here, you see, what I want you to grasp, you see the nature of God, Jehovah. See, thus says the Lord, that's Jehovah, the God of Israel. And his redeemer, the Lord of hosts, that's Jehovah. I am the first and I am the last. There is no God. So you see three distinct personalities in the Godhead. What makes them God? They have a divine nature. They have something that we will, will never have. And they were not created. They are eternal. The only three that are eternal, the Holy, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Remember, we looked at in the Bible, the angelic beings, the spiritual beings were created. Uh, man was created by God. We don't have a divine in nature because divine nature, they're, they're not created. If you have the divine nature, not created. And so, it you know, it's like you look at Isaiah 44, they contradict themselves because they're creating these, they're creating these image, but divine nature there's no creation. They're eternal, which I don't understand. I just have to believe, I accept it. I believe it, but I'll never understand that. That's just not even something I can comprehend. So to make an image and say, this is God. Well, it's like we read about Domitian in Revelation in, in when um, Daniel 7 prophesies about his coming. Uh, he decided, again, you're going to Roman history, that he was going to be God. Uh, um, and his what he did was widespread and never even though there was persecution by all the emperors but he took it to another level but that's ludicrous that's ridiculous because you can't you can't give yourself a divine nature he was created himself to be divine you know that it's ridiculous for someone to even just sit himself to be a god you see and so I am the first and I am the last, and there is no God besides me. You see two distinct personalities right here. So I'm going to repeat it. There's one God, that God is that, that divine 
nature, we're not talking about three gods. That divine nature possessed three distinct personalities, but there's only one God. See, that divine nature is, is God, okay? That divine nature is God, and he is the creator of the universe. When you get into, let us make man in our own image, that's that divine nature. See, there are three distinct personalities in that divine nature nature. Now watch Psalms, go to Psalms chapter 2. Um, let's go to some, you know, let's go to Genesis 126. Genesis 126. Genesis 126. Now watch this. And God said, let us make man in our, own, in our own image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish and the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over the all the earth, and over every creep, creeping thing that creeps on uh, the earth. So how, how would the Pentecostal who says Jesus only, how would they get around that? Well, they say that, that this image here is um, angelic, and they, they say it's an angelic image. Okay, so, you know, that's what they say. And so, you know, when you see, um, and God said, let us make man our own image, let us, that's plural, and they look at it as, a, as an angelic image. Okay, so... Let's look at that. God then God said, Let us make man, let us make man in our own image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish. And so, you know, our image, you see, that's that image is is defined in that verse. You know, there's the image. Let us make it our make man in our own image according to the likeness of according to our likeness and let him here's the image, let him rule over the fish and the sea, et cetera. It's giving man that authority, okay? But they say that this is uh, an angelic image. That's, to me, that doesn't, first of all, the context doesn't even, that doesn't say that. Uh, you know, let us make man on all image, that's plural, let us, in our, that's plural, you see, and so, uh, look at you know you got in Hebrew. Let's go to let's go to Hebrews and we're gonna go back. Let's go to Hebrews chapter two, and we see that now we we're not gonna stay there long. But if we go to Hebrews, we know that man was created in the image of God. I mean, man, man was I'm sorry. Yeah, man was created in the image of God, but man was you know he was created lower than the angels. So you know that's there's a difference there. Uh, he was made lower than the angels. Look at and notice interesting Hebrews chapter two and verse sixteen. Notice there is no help uh, for salvation. It's like I'm reading it first. For surely he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to descendants of Abraham. So it's it's amazing that uh, when angels they, they it's like there's no salvation for angels, but there's salvation for mankind. And that we, you know, and we see in in this um, this uh, this chapter, this uh, book that, that uh, man was made. Uh, you have, the, uh, you know, Christ was made. You know, man was made lower than the angels. So that's that's kind of ludicrous to say that 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 image represents a, its angelic image. When no, there's a difference there because that's you, you know, uh, even Christ, you know, he was. He's God, and he became the son of God. He was made lower than the angels, didn't give up his deity. But, you, you know, you have man, you see the difference. You have, you have the angelic beings, you have the, uh, the human nature, the angelic nature. And so, no, that's not true what they say. Uh, let me see. I think it was, what time? I think his time is up. We're going to start. I want to deal with that again next week. 
I want to go back to that passage and we're going to head to other passages to deal with this. But the main objective, I just took uh, this belief system and kind of worked with it to help us understand the nature of God. Uh, and, and I don't want us to ever uh, misunderstand that we have to understand that Christ uh, has always contained the, the divine nature in his body. And now we see how powerful he is and he's still working with the church. So as we go through life and turmoil and difficulties, remember, we're dealing with we're dealing with the king who understands, who never gave up his divine nature, but gave up something, some things for us that we may be saved. And you know, as he stayed faithful until the end, now he's sitting on the right hand of God in Revelation 2.10, uh, Revelation 3.21. If we stay faithful till the end, then we also will be with God like him. But we have to stay faithful. We have to trust in him. He has that divine nature. We have to trust him. If anyone here needs help, you need prayers, please don't hesitate. We'll pray for you if that's what you need. If you need to repent, make it known as we sing the song for the invitation.